Yeah, I, the odds are against me, but I'll tell you what, though, I believe I can beat the odds. You know? I know in my heart, I can. my mother said, you can beat the odds, you know. You know, make it to see another day, you know, you know, the sun's gonna come back out tomorrow, you know. That's how I live my life. You know? A lot of people didn't get to wake up today, you know. It goes back to like being grateful, you know. You have no reason to complain about anything. You got your board, you know, you have friends, you know, you got your body, it's like, damn, you know. Somebody say you're not a city kid, you know, I'm not. I'm not where I want to be, right? But thank God I'm not where I used to be, you know? You can't even put like a, a label on him because he's just a guy you want to be around. Harry was a fucking New York OG in the street defining that shit like nobody. Like, every single skater in New York City owes their whole shit to Harry. He's like one of the last of the old school, literally, like, you think of Alva. He's just, he's got soul, he's got emotion. He's raw, you know? Jumanji, he's Jumanji, man. He's got the name, he has everything. He has the whole package. And to this day, I mean, he's in his 40s. He has the energy of a fucking 12-year-old that just kind of figured out how much he loves his skateboard. As far as New York skating, the arts, I mean, Harry is New York. That's Harry's New York City. Skating was not what it was today. It was really like if you were a skater, you would see like another guy skating, and that was your friend. I mean, you needed to hook up. I remember the first time I met Harry was in Washington Square Park, and there was a sort of poor group of us who was skating there, and, and one day I saw this guy and he was just kind of flying around the park, and the skateboard seemed to be attached to his, his feet. I was like, who's that guy? Who's, who's that guy? And he was like, that's Harry. That's Harry. I remember those dudes, like, flying into the park, and it was like this very... Brando-esque wild ones, you know, when the Black Rebel Motorcycle Club runs into town and it's just like, oh shit, like, who the fuck are these guys? And Harry was in the front, like, you know, he's got a very distinct push and then a huge, like, backside slide and, you know, like, kind of looking at everybody as he's sliding into them and you're just like, oh, fuck. We'd always skate from the park down to the banks. Harry was always the best. Always the first dude down there, just doing the raddest shit on the way down there. Just like out of control, causing mayhem. Like with this fucking crazy little haircut he had. We used to call him the spoiler. She had like a spoiler in the front. It was so crazy. This blonde frosted tips. And he was just like, we'd always be like, Harry's the first one downtown because he's got the most aerodynamic haircut. This is a crazy story, okay? There was a guy named Jimmy Gestapo in the story of Queens. Like, everybody knows who Jimmy Gestapo is, he's the lead singer of Murphy's Law. He goes, yo, Jumanji, man, they got banks under the Brooklyn Bridge. I was like, he's the guy that told me. And there were banks under the Brooklyn Bridge. So I go, watch the square, is where we met, and then we went to the Brooklyn Mets. You got so many people in the Brooklyn Mets, nobody. People throwing bottles at us, and it was dirty. The only time the Brooklyn Mets got clean is when it rained. And that was our skate park, and we were happy with it, you know. So the first contest that happened at the Brooklyn Banks, Harry was a major star. All those contests uh, would just be like a demo for Harry. There was a thing in the Brooklyn Banks. It was slalom, freestyle, and the Banks, you know. I got the overall Brooklyn Banks skater, you know. I had the trophy, you know. Harry was awesome. He was just unique, his own style. Uh, he was the first person I saw like ollie over something high, like in person, like actually seeing someone like jump over boards, like stacked up, probably like four boards at the Brooklyn Banks. Harry was better than everybody. He was smoother than everybody. He just had it. He was natural. 
but he was also inclusive. He wasn't like, oh, you can't skate with me. He was just like, yeah, come on, let's go skate. Let's go here, let's go there. And it's now like uh, thinking too much to do a trick. He always like, oh, let's try this. I just saw this locomotive train type skater coming at me at like 20 miles an hour and he just did a slappy nose grind and that just blew my mind and then he just kept going off and those are the moments where they're never repeated and when they happen you're just blown away and there's like a glow around them. Show him a trick, you know, this is how you do it basically. He's like Christian Hosoi like that. You just like kind of, he would look at it like do it again kind of physically study you. Oh, okay, you're pushing with your, okay, let me do that. And he'd have it. And then he'd like style it out. Skateboard is like a brush. And the streets is like the canvas. And if you really want to paint a pretty picture, all you gotta do is ride it, you know? Every time I saw him skate, I was enamored with his skateboarding. And we just hung out in Washington Square Park and, and we'd hang out, we'd party, we'd skate. So we, we put a hat out, that's Dante, and we do freestyle tricks, and next thing you know, man, like $300, your know, tourist, five, one, you know? Like we made money skateboarding, watch the skateboard park. And here's the crazy thing, the police used to hold the crowd back. There's a crew of like seven people. I'm not talking about like people were not cruising down the streets, and that's when you were like, dude, you skate, you know? And you reach out to somebody. Bruno was there from the very beginning. Pepe Torre is so good, man. Coming in here from South America, like the kid knew how to do inverts and he adapt real quick with street skating. And Jeremy coming in here, this is 30 years ago, man. Like, do your math, you know? I'm sitting there, there's a guy on a bike, he's got a cast, like, yeah, I skate. I say, Pablo? Then he comes and gets on his board. I'm like, dude, this guy knows how to skate. And then Tony Converse, like, there was a crew of people that knew how to wall ride, he was one of them, you know? It wasn't everybody knew how to wall ride. Wall ride is like, here's the wall, here's the ground, and what do you do? You <coughs> somehow manage to shift the board from the flat ground to a 90 degree wall and ride it. Aliasha came a couple of years later, but guess what, he's one of the OGs, man. Then you got guys like Andy Kessler. Andy was realistically, in terms of historical value, one of the most important people of skateboarding in New York. Like if you go into skateboarding history, Andy will be the first guy. Like I said, we don't have Jay Adams, we don't got Tony Albert, but we got Andy, you know. That was street skating. There was no one else. I didn't know Keith Huffnagel. He's supposed to be from New York. I don't know him. He's a dude with a shop in San Francisco. You know, a lot of, I, I'm just saying, there was seven or eight people. That's who they were. If you weren't in that group, we don't know you. You know, it was a time in New York when we sort of were in awe of California because California had the ramps and the pools and, and all the California skaters and, and all we had was one uh, ramp out in Red Hook that we would occasionally go out to. It's like, this city is a spot, skating to and from. That's street skating. You don't even need to do a trick. Do a slappy, ollie a fucking crosswalk, not like, sitting around in $500 worth of fucking pristine clothing and shoes with a brand new skateboard, waiting for someone to build you a skate park. Every nook and cranny and tricks on everything and just utilizing your obstacles there. Street skating was what happened between Washington Square Park and the Brooklyn Banks. The madness, they went down, oh, like sh sh you know? When you're pushing on Broadway, and there's cabs and buses and people on bikes, there's no green lights. Fucking skate down Broadway, and let's see who gets down to the Brooklyn Banks first, without getting hit by a car. That was like the beginning of street skating for the world. And this is even before Mark Gonzalez came to New York, which is like the big beginning of street skating. Years before that. Rodney Mullen says, oh yeah, I'm a, uh, people say I'm the godfather of the street skateboarding. Fuck you. You are not the first guy to always some over over some person squatted on the ground, you know what I mean? They went, Gons is, Nottis is, nah. As much as Mark Gonzalez and Nottis Kalpas, Larry Jalungi. Truthfully, just as much, and I saw it. Skateboarding in the early 80s, like Mark Gonzalez, Nottis, Christian Sue, everybody had their own thing, you know? 
Like I backside all the 180 off a jump ramp. Nobody done that. <clears throat> I did a 360 slide. Nobody done that. I still an edge carve. Wow, where'd you find this guy? He's like New York. But I'm not from New York, I'm from Brazil. My father left when I was seven. Then I went with my mom. And single parenting, correct? But great, you know? My relationship with Harry was always not so good. Never so good, never. So I was kind of a father that, uh, you know, would scream and yell at my children and uh, I wanted to, like, uh, you know, my... Uh, uh, I wouldn't even, even think about them, you understand? So what they thought and things like that. So my relationship with my children were, were never good, never good, never. The real deal was that my father had like this great education, like all these credentials. Like I actually seen some of his stuff, you know? Like he went to Cambridge, all that, you know, like Japanese, English, Portuguese, and then he does the import export thing. And he, him and his other guy bought the barcode machine to Brazil. So that was big, like Gentec. So, you know, they have this like huge office, everything. I'm just with my mom, like I'm a little kid. And then, you know, um, like all these gifts and stuff, you know, he's always wearing a suit. I remember the smell of cologne, but it wasn't the same memories with my mom. My mother's a type of woman that there was a thing in Brazil called carnival, okay? People have customers and they go out and they party once a year and they live for that. My mother's the woman that made the costumes for the people that had no money for free just so they can go out and have fun, you know? Um, my mother's the one that was like building a skateboard ramp. She was with a hammer helping me. Those are my, I don't know, those are my greatest memories. Na verdade, Ubatuba é uma cidade pequena. Então, todos que começavam algum tipo de esporte com prancha se conheciam. Harry was like always uh, going to skateboard or to surf outside of the house. Porque ele era, ele era um, como eu falei, ele era um, era um líder. Se se encontrava na praia, se encontrava à noite. Era um grupo de uns 30 amigos. Mais radical assim. Eu já sou um cara mais de linha, um cara que surfa mais my soul surfing, né? Tinha onda. Ah, não tinha onda, então onda de skate. Tinha uma praça lá, e naquela época era aqueles skate bandeirantes. Né? 1976 is when I saw Jay Adams on the cover of Skateboarding Magazine. He's like, like, you know, like flying off the ball, grabbing the nose and the tail. The trucks are this small. I, I remember like it was yesterday. There was a Cooper helmet, which is made for hockey. It was volleyball knee pads, he had a pair of blue vans, and a Logan Artsky board, Bennett trucks, and roll rider wheels. I was in a surf shop and I was like, wow, I want to learn how to do that. And um, I somehow my mom helped me out. I trade my board for a skateboard and then we put new wheels in it. And people were skating barefooted, like when there was no waves. But it was like, it was it, man. I remember I jumped on the board and I felt like at home. Só que ele tinha uma habilidade de skate absurda, né? Ele era um cara que realmente andava muito de skate e a gente costuma dizer que é born to skate, né? Um cara que nasceu, você via que ele já tinha um, um feeling de andar de skate e era uma criança. Então, na verdade, ele tinha de 11, 10, 11, 12 anos na época que ele se conheceu. I used to wear elbow pads on my knees. I got for just like small, like big helmet. Like, they used to call me little formiga, like a little ant, you know? Like, my feet was too small, like skate. Eu era para poucos que tinham esse estilo, porque o skate no Brasil era muito novo. Ele era meu ídolo no skate. Eu, eu, eu olhava ele andando, eu queria fazer as mesmas manobras. He brought real feeling to skateboarding. He could just mix everything up. You know, so he was more than like we were. He couldn't relate them. He was like the next generation. You know, it's just the gap itself. É, fazia questão de manter o estilo dele, né? O estilo, quase sempre, tava surfando. E... É, é, por, essa, por essa influência, assim, eu acho que, pô, ele deixou o skate mais bonito. E, então, rapidinho, ele já foi considerado um dos melhores skatistas do Brasil. I got sponsored when I was 11 or 12 by a big surfing company in Brazil. 
and it had the licensing of the lightning bolt. So I had a shirt that says Equipe de Competição, which means, you know, not racing theme, but like, and um, being on magazines already and did a, like a Bengay commercial, you know. But all that's with skateboarding, you know. But at the time, you know, I'm still like a kid, and like, but I'm skating with the older guys, and um, I progressed real quick. Na minha opinião, acho que o Harry foi e é um grande skatista brasileiro, é uma lenda. Eu acho que o Harry foi um dos primeiros a fazer street style no Brasil. Era muito criança, eu era muito moleque. Então era mais o dia a dia, assim, não tem, era mais o lance de pegar o skate, andar, ficar o dia inteiro na rua, dormir na rua. I'm gonna lie to you, we'll take like a bus from here to New Jersey and then go to Connecticut. That's how far it was, just to get to the skate park. And then we stay there for the weekend and then we come back on a Sunday night. Isso aí, isso aí acabou acabando, né? No, no... Ninguém mais fazia isso, atravessar a cidade inteira de skate, pra cima e pra baixo. É, e a gente conviveu junto aqui pelo centro e a gente, de certa forma, acabou desbravando bastante locais que hoje em dia são, são os locais que, onde o pessoal anda de skate na cidade, né? Mamãe na escola, ela sabia how much eu love skate, that's one thing I never forget. My mom knew I had two backpacks, I had a backpack with the books and I had a backpack with the knee pads, elbow pads and the helmet. And when I leave the house, she goes, she knew where I went, I went skating. But then, you know, I come home with like the trophy, you know, and she was so supportive. I mean, she actually let me do what I love, you know. I tell you what, I was not a good father. Now I can recognize, I'm sorry, I regret very much. Because there's a lot of yelling in the house and a lot of bullshit, you know. And my father had a girlfriend on the side who's prettier than my mom. The whole time I met him, uh, he never would go back to his house. If it, it was like he didn't have a house. He would like crash here, crash there. I guess he just wanted to be out, you know? And then she got tired of his shit and then she broke out and then we went to this hotel, you know? And I'm like, a hotel, you know? What happened to home, you know? So at the early age, I knew that the way things were, you know? I went to New York in 1983. I took Harry with me because I wanted them to be in the United States. There was no negotiation. I cried. I didn't want to come. I never figured that, uh, you know, the, uh, the impact would be so devastating. Of course, you know, but now it's too, too late. I'm very sorry about that. He went there, everyone was like, Pô, where was he? He went to the United States. Well, he left. We were isolated. We were orphans of Harry. I did my own thing, you know. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to stay in New York City. I was in Queens, it was like Bayside, it's fucking snowing. Get on the subway, it's like crazy. Yo, what you wear is like crazy. It was like, you know, like people talk about the 80s. That shit was like the city was falling apart, man. Mayor Koch, whatever, the shit was crazy, man. It was scary. I mean, if you spend one winter in New York City and you're from Brazil and you skateboarder, you'd be like, fuck this, I'm out of here, like 20 below. So my dad was like, oh, you don't want to go to school. You got to work. You want to go to California and work. So I worked for him. And then I worked at this fish market for like two weeks, not me two months. And he actually doubled my money, 1800 I had 900 1800 He drove me to LaGuardia. I got on a plane. I was by myself, you know. I had weed on my knee pads. It was crazy. And I flew to LAX. I went to this Brazilian guys. I met Skip. I have this weird intuition about people sometimes. There's a certain, I think, um, internal geometry that people have that when they walk and talk or how they deal with you physically, you can see that they're a little bit different than just the normal person on the street. Just kind of got the idea that he probably was a pretty good skater and, and he enjoyed surfing. And so I went, well, here's some boards or something. And then saw him skate and I was, you know, pleased actually that I was right again. Skateboarding continued, but you know, 
Now I'm skating with the guys that I saw in magazines, and they're like, they accept me, like, you know, like, yeah, Harry. Like, kids like look at Spider Man, you know, Batman, you know, Michael Jordan, Jay Z. Dude, I look up to like Tony Alva, Jay Adams, Christian Oso, you know. Dudes that they were just like punk rock, like skateboarders, you know, they're like amazing, amazing. Went to San Diego, got in Huntington, skated with the pros, you know, it was NSA Street Skating Contest in Huntington Beach, I remember September. He's in a magazine, NSA. I remember Harry skating there, and I kept thinking, this son of a bitch keeps getting in my goddamn way. And he's getting in the way of what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do. And I was pretty pissed off at the time, but now that I've done what I wanted to do and got to that point, I'm at the point where I actually appreciate what he was doing at that time. Mark Gonzalez came in, he killed it, you know? Those are the guys I absorbed, like, all that skateboarding. The street skating was getting huge at that time, and, uh, I was there. I think I met Harry hanging out in the streets, just a young, young Brazilian New Yorker, you know, with a lot of attitude, spiked hair, and uh, a lot of style on a skateboard. This kind of style that we skated with, and it was refreshing, and it was just a kid, like 12, 12 13, and he had the crazy, really excited energy, and had the Harry personality when he was a little kid. But he had skills. But there's some legendary guys that they saw me in Delma and then we vibed them, you know, I told them how to front side roll in. Like front side roll in is like you don't drop in from the tail, you just roll and you drop in. And I knew how to do that in Brazil. And it's like I made a difference on those guys and then they were like psyched like to like to have me in a park. So I was one of those guys, you know, like, yo, drop in, Harry. So and then Steve Caballero, yeah, Christian Osoy, Tony Hawk. And I remember, like, Tony came up to me, you know, and he, he, he knew how to skateboard. We did a commercial together. He goes, yo, Harry, show me how to ollie that high. I got up on the thing this high. And, you know, like, it felt good being a kid and having, like, Tony Hawk asking you, show me how to ollie that high. You can ask him, you know? So it's easy to get up on top of things. I was like, yo, scoop from the back. And I learned that from Rodney Mullen. So, you know, I ollie real high, but I scooped it from the back. And the only guy I know who can do it without scooping it from the back is Mark Gonzalez who's in a whole different category. Harry's a skater skater. He's got attitude. He doesn't try to jump through hoops for people. He does his own thing. He likes to be original. Being in California in 83 was wow. And everything was like, go to Delmar skate park. And when they closed Delmar, like, I cried, man. It was crazy. So they closed the skate parks, and street skating got big. And they had the jump ramps. And, you know, you adapt. You get in where you fit in, you know? And I got real good at jump ramps. His presence would just like take over the whole session, you know? He come in with this fresh style and just, like we're like, he's gotta be pro because he got so much style. Then I took off for sure, so he, he was like, you wanna ride for us? And then at the same time, the guy from Dogtown was like, oh, if things don't count with Christian, call us, Dogtown. Then the guy from Vision came in, and I'm like, wow, you know? And, you know, if, I didn't know I was that good. I thought it was just like, I stayed on my board for 45 seconds. Truth is, I was more consistent. I'd be able to shut down the contest, the music, everybody do my routine, you know? When he started skating for Christian, it was like, oh, fuck, of course, that's perfect. Of course, Christian, you know, Hasoy sponsoring Harry. By that time, Harry was the only uh, East Coast dude that used to skate for Christian. Going to show skates and watching him, like, open Hasoy boxes, and we were just kind of blown away because you're trying to, like, work for your mom to save up to buy a board every six months and this dude's getting like a box of like six to eight boards from Hasoy, who's a demigod unto himself. I looked up to Christian and his whole crew and Harry was a part of that so I basically try to be like them. They were like my idols. Christian was like the epitome of power and style. Like he was the icon for that type of skating. They had the style, you know, the looks, knew how to skateboard real well. Very original, very fluid and uh, and they helped me out. Him and his father helped me out a lot, you know. And they were like, yeah, go to New York, go to the Rolling Stones magazine, this and that. I was like, no, I don't want to go to New York. My father said, I'll come back to New York City, and I came back. And boom, got an interview magazine, huge, you know, huge, huge event. Like, you know, street skating, road warriors. Me and Jose got the full pages. That opened up a lot of doors at the time, you know. And I didn't know who Kid Harry was, but he actually painted a skateboard and gave it to me. And I did a layback. He goes, oh, don't touch that, that's art. 
That's Harry Jamon just, you know, skateboarding and laid back. So he gives me the sweatshirt and goes, hey, hey, look, I got for your birthday. He says, happy birthday, Harry, Andy, Warhol. And then Keith Harry, you know, and had a, and I was like, wow, you know, maybe it would be nice if I would have kept that shirt, you know. It was a shirt given to me, you know, for my birthday. And this was 86. I didn't know how big it was. I just saw crack his rack, you know. Pop was largely still new. So we'd go to like a CB's matinee on Sunday. We'd all meet in Washington Square Park, skate around, go to CB's. Go skate around the city, go like take the train uptown, skate all the way back down to Washington Square Park. Then go to like Nell's with, with Jeremy and you know, just hang out with Sade while Flavor Flav played the piano. And that's like a real thing. You know, or like Jeremy working on Basquiat paintings. Jeremy is one of those guys that don't brag about it, but at the time, like, you know, dude, Basquiat used to give us $200, go get like, you know, doors. Cause he had the money to paint on canvas, but he was good at painting on wood. Cause that's all he had before he became big. And the funny thing is Basquiat was just crazy, gifted. But crazy, you know, like it took me 30 years. Like I went to the Brooklyn show and I was like, dude, this guy was amazing, man, you know? The downtown scene in those early 80s, incredibly vital and just incredible melange of different influences. Keith Haring was still alive. Jean-Michel was still alive. Francisco Clemente and all these different people were in this scene, artists, photographers, just nobodies, dancers, transvestite, you know, it's like, that was the vital time of everything coalescing and creating the whole popular culture we have today, where skateboarding, graffiti, art, music are like indistinguishable. But all of a sudden, the downtown scene was created. Right, and Harry was right in the middle of that. There was a stupid thing on the East Village Voice. Yeah, and then the city, they were screaming, skate or die. And now I look back and like, wow, that shit sounds corny, but that's what they were saying, skate or die, you know? Like with the flat top, skating in the banks. So we did the shoot, they did a story, and they bought us like a case of beer. We were cool, you know, it's like, and then uh, I didn't know, like 20 years later, I found out, you know, Village Voices was amazing, like Norman Mailer, it's like, you know, downtown, people talk about downtown, but Village Voice was the shit, you know? Like at nighttime, you go to St. Mark's, it's like a big whole freak show, you know what I mean? Like punk rock kids, you know, hanging out, sitting on the sidewalks. Police didn't do shit about that, you know? It was a big playground. We were all into art, skating and surfing, music, movies. It's not every day you'll run into a skater and be like, oh, you know, let's talk about El Topo or something. I don't give a fuck when nobody said New York City is the center of the universe. Everything happens here. I almost feel like we took it for granted because it was like a day-to-day -day thing. And it was just the time and the place. This was downtown and there was strange mix of people, including skaters. Oftentimes, we always knew the doormen. Limousines would be pulling up. It's Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. Oh, sorry, you can't get in. They diss them. They're right there getting dissed. Harry, me, and someone else come skating up. Literally bloody legs, skateboards come up, pop the board up. Hey, what's up, Lisa? Right into the fucking club. Hip hop and skateboarding are kind of commingling and, and generally just starting to float. Then we put a half pipe in area. And that was crazy. That was really crazy. We skate in a nightclub. Here's this ramp, chain link fence, and then Outside of the cage was the real zoo. People are ah, banging, you know, like freaks, you know, like animals, you know. But then you turn around, it's like Grace Jones, man, you know, Run DMC, it was Madonna, you know. It was insanely fun. And Munchie Munchie was right in the mix. He's kind of like the host of, of everything, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, he could link everybody together because he's just a guy you want to be around. That was a limit for Harry because he, you know, one thing about the culture of skateboarding, um, a lot of people are devoid of personality. It's kind of one dimensional a little bit. And Harry wasn't a one dimensional cat. Could have been like what modern skaters do now. It's like not only are they involved in skateboarding, they're doing skateboarding, but they involve with marketing products, things like that. Like he was already doing it. He was like too far ahead. 
He got a whole page in Treasure Magazine. This is my hero right there. He's like a superhero. That he's gonna be the next Christian story. Like, undoubtedly. He was unstoppable. <laughs> he was unstoppable. What do you mean he's smoking crack? That's crazy. So you got the sponsors, you got the girls, skateboarding, and it's like, oh, take a hit of this, and it's over, you know? I hate to say it, but, you know, Andy introduced Harry to drugs, and Andy stopped, and, and Harry, you know, carried on. And he was getting high, I didn't know what he was doing upstairs, and I'm gonna make this real short. So I didn't know what was going on up there, and I waited for him downstairs, you know. He stayed up there for like hours, and I'm like, yo, let's go skating. Then one time I went upstairs with him, and then there's guys in the bathroom, there's a little scale, there's the tin foil, and like, oh, wow. And, you know, I wasn't even a pothead, you know. They were smoking heroin, and they would cook up cocaine and smoking. Free base cocaine and um, but he gave me my first hit and I was like, whoa, it's, you know, it's too much. I did not like it. Drugs at that time was just they were everywhere, Washington Square Park, and and so you know, I mean, it was one of the things that kind of broke up that whole group was was we were all doing a lot of drugs. I go to the skate shop, you know, and it's like, yo, they don't got no blow. And then this girl named Bunny, you know, she was in a movie like Wild Style, whatever, she's breakdancing. And I remember, like, it was yesterday, this is crazy, yo. She put it, this thing on the pipe, like, she lit up, she took the torch, her kids are sitting there, like, took the torch, she sat down, and she went like this. And I went, and I remember the first thing I said, I went like this, I hear it through my pocket, I was like, can we get more? I remember, it's like crazy, can we get more? It's like more, you know? Harry was like a kid from out of the country, no ID, no family there, making his way in the city. Like, you know, I couldn't imagine that kind of a life. And, but he was in the big city and he would show up to skate, but he had this whole other life. I remember specifically uh, the first time I ever tried crack was, the first time I ever heard of it was Harry. I was like, hey man, you gotta try this, you gotta try this. And I was like, what is it? Like, it's crack, it's crack. Let's crack up, just try it in the pipe and do it like this. And, and I was there with my girlfriend at the time, and, and we both sort of tried it, but there wasn't that much. We tried it. And I remember we were like, wow, man, wow, that was really good. That was really good. Let's go get some more. And then we went back, and Harry was talking to this really, really skeevy woman, and there wasn't any left. And, and I think, fortunately for me, there wasn't any. And I kind of went my separate ways and didn't really think about it. But it, then Harry got into it, and he got into it quickly. Within one month, I was like, oh, I know where to cop, you know? And right here on the Lower East Side in Washington Square. You know, you didn't have to go to Harlem. You could go to a bodega, I shouldn't say that. And to go to the Dominican guy and give him $30, and he'd give you like a gram of Coke, and he'd go and cook it up. At the time, the rush was like, like probably, you know, going into space and coming back down on the skateboard. I mean, it was like insane, you know, it was like, I was like, wow, you know? And uh, uh, that's what it is, it's like a five second to a 10 second rush that, and then the 90% the of the time you're chasing that first hit. But then I didn't know that, <laughs> like once like the dopamine stops coming out, you know, it's empty. It's, then that's it, and then the nervous system, that's why people be like, you know, Weekend, you know, or the paranoia comes in. So in the beginning, I'm like, yeah, I can handle this, you know, bullshit. Within six months, like he went from being like the guy, hey, happy, day. going up, here, my papa. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> want, that's good for your soul. You gotta suffer. To all of a sudden, I'd see him in the park, and this was only a couple months later, like sores on the mouth, and and I, I have this image of him sleeping in Washington Square Park, just lying there without a skateboard. I mean, think, like seeing him, like, the only time I'd ever seen him without a skateboard. I didn't go back to Queens to see my dad because I was a little dirty and I was up for like two to three days. And um, it's embarrassing, you know. Like everybody else kind of went on to do things, and then Harry just kind of started disappearing. 
then he'd be like, yo, what's up with Jumanji? And he's like, yo, 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 Jumanji's out again. He's out, he's fuck, I, let's go look for him. And I'd be like, okay, let's go fucking look for Harry. It was like, you know, where's Waldo? It was sad, but it was very true. Where's Harry, you know? I'll be right back. And I'm gone, like two, three days. Pretty heavy stuff, man. We're not talking about sniffing coke, ecstasy, going to clubs. It's like smoking crack on all in the projects. Like, in hell, like piss on the floor, bottles, blood on the seat. Like, yeah, you sit in there, like. But it, that's where it takes you, you know? It will take you there. I had a friend who had an apartment on St. Mark's Place. And one time we found Harry fucked up, late night, three o'clock in the morning, like bum style. Le like laid out. So it's like, all right, we're gonna take you and like sober you up. We bring him to this apartment, starts to DT, feeding him, to the best of our ability. I mean, admittedly, we didn't really know what we were doing other than keeping him off the street. But then he gets to the place where he's like, he wants to leave. Like he's good, he's healthy enough. He wants to get up and go, get high. We won't let him out. I come back, they've got Harry zip tied to the bed now because he wants to leave and they couldn't keep him. I get left with Harry dialoguing me, hours on hours on end. I know the errors of my way. I see it's all about this, you know, we know, Tony, you know, it's about, I have to remember, Mother Ocean, da, da, da. Finally, I'm like, all right, you know, I'll let him out of the zip cuffs. I don't know, I mean, I like turn around, he's out, the fire escape, gone from the apartment. Next thing I find out, He's gone to the precinct and reported that we kidnapped him. And this, to this day, stands as my example of how I cannot help a junkie friend. If you're gonna use drugs, use drugs. But don't become a drug addict that the drugs are doing you instead of you doing the drugs. Like, uh, look, can we go skateboard? No, because you're out getting fucking hot. Your hands down, say crack cocaine, brought me to my knees, it's really, it, it, it just, it didn't stole anything, okay? It just took me to a place where everything that was sacred, skateboarding, because at the end of the day, you know, I like rice and beans, I like kids, animals, surfing, skateboarding, you know? Like a nice sunny day, you know? And it's like smoking crack, it's like all that's out the window. I mean, the fact that he's still alive is mind boggling for all the shit he's been through. He screwed up, he got locked up, which was probably the best thing for him. The first time I got locked up and went into the system, I was a little shook. I just didn't show the fear because when you go to prison, first time going to prison, if you show fear, it's a weakness, and they eat up on that. And I knew that before I went to prison, but, you know. I was so mad. I was so, you know, pissed off. And uh, I went to prison and uh, the screaming, yelling at him, you know. And, uh, but didn't work anyway. I remember when I got locked up, he was like, you're an asshole, you're in jail for drugs. Next time we'll rob a bank. And he's like, you know, do your time with dignity. And I was like, whoa, really? He wrote a letter to our mother. He was sorry, I'm um, doing wrong things for being in jail, you know? And she cried because she didn't know that he was in jail. When you think about a friend of yours going to fucking Rikers for 18 months or going upstate or whatever, you know, you're just like, God, he's gonna get eaten alive. But I never really worried about Harry that way just because of his personality and the type of person he is. I'm like, oh, he'll be, you know, he'll work it out. He'll figure it out. He'll be fine. Clearly stated, don't fuck with drugs, gambling, gangs, homos. You know what I'm saying? Those are the things you don't do when you go to jail. If you really want to do your time, you know what I mean? You can die in prison. Trust me, I'm not. I'm not a tough guy. I'm fucking, I'm not tough. The whole idea of just criminalizing that behavior seems so crazy. You know? It's an illness. It should be. There should be help for people like that. There should be places where they can put them and where they're taken care of, as opposed to Rikers Island is not a, a way to deal with drug addiction. He's someone that seemed to clean up in jail, even though you don't have to if you don't want to, pretty well. Um, and I think the structure of a place like prison for him was good. You work out. You exercise your body. You exercise your brain. You go to the library. You know. And you do your bed, you know? It's like, I refuse to be miserable. Like, I've seen guys like, yo, don't let the time do you, do the time. And then I started doing my calligraphy. So it was good, you know? And then the guys, they're never gonna come home. And I'm like making cards for the kids, you know? And this guy said, hey, you smart. 
Why don't you get a GED, man? What are you gonna do? Like one day your kids are gonna say, Daddy, help me do this. What are you gonna tell them? You're choking, watching videos, working out, reading skateboarding magazines, get your GED. And I thought about it. Six weeks later, I got it. And I haven't been in school since I was 12. Bang, Man, blast that, got the GED. It felt good. Even my father, like they had it on the back of the skate shop. They had like, you know, and it's a Cayuga Correctional Facility. It's the state of New York, you know, and um, then I knew I could do something with my life. The minute I met him, he was so amazing that the, the prison time in my head when I heard about it was behind him. I thought he was, he looked so healthy, he was great. Never again, he's learned his lesson. Straight shooter from now on. If I saw a crack pipe, I felt like throwing up. I hated it, I was like, dude, this robbed me out of my skateboarding time. You know, it robbed me out of time spent with my friends skateboarding. I love skateboarding more than crack. I think Andy might have been the one who introduced him to like getting sober and getting shit together. And Andy was a very, way worse than Harry, drug addict. And he was real rough, rough character and bully. And you know, he used to steal kids skateboards. And, and I knew that side of Andy. I mean, Andy was dark, you know, he'd be a real son of a bitch. But Andy, having found sobriety, was a perfect partner for Harry. He could identify with the damage that he had been done and the suffering that he was going through. He really took him under his wing and really cared about him and loved him unconditionally, you know? Harry used to listen to him. That's the problem with Harry. Harry never liked to listen to nobody. He always like, dude, I'll take it to a meeting, you know? And then it clicked on after a while, like the, the meeting is going with Andy. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't really hard to like, you know, believe you having a guy that was smoking crack and doing dope every day and stopped skateboarding, getting cleaned up and started building skate parks in New York City and helping all the addicts, you know. He was a living proof, I am. And then within 90 days, I'd bug out. It's like, dude, you come out, and everybody's like, yo, oh, you you like, you know, you shine and everything, and then you bug out, and like, you don't know how to live, you don't know how to stay clean. Andy would try, pull him to meetings, put him in rehab, detox. And it was always like, well, Andy, when are you gonna just give it up? And Andy never gave up. I remember like, you know, he said, lift up your hand and say, um, I know how to skateboard, I know how to go, I know how to go to jail, but I don't know how to live. God, I hate to say it, especially on film, but like, Harry in New York City, I can't see him clean. I really can't. If you come out of jail into the same environment, you're gonna, it's gonna be a recidivist situation. There's no ambiguity, it's a direct correlation. And Harry knows that city like, you know, the back of his hand. He knows where the dangerous, slippery spots are for him and where there's people that really love him and want the best for him. It's like if there was a big bank covered with ice, you know, and it looked like a perfect skate spot and it was covered with ice, would you try and skate on it? No because you're gonna fall and you're gonna get hurt. But when it comes to the other aspects of life, even though it's slippery and it's got ice on it, he's still gonna try and skate on it. Then he'd get locked up again. And then he'd come out and it was this horrible cycle. And I mean, I saw him a while, I can't, I, it happened so many times, you lose track. Every time I got arrested after I smoked crack for days, I was like, thank God this stopped, you know? I think unconsciously, you know, I, um. I don't know, sometimes the cops would arrest people and I'd be in the spot and I was like, yo, how about me? Like, I want to stop smoking crack. I know it sounds crazy, but some people ask for help, you know? I, I, I didn't know how to ask for help. I knew people, I just, I was embarrassed, you know? But I knew how to do time and I knew how to do time in jail and, you know? It's like, you go back to jail like it's a vacation, you know? When it's time for him, when he's tired, that's where he goes, he goes to jail, you know? And he likes to talk about how he's a celebrity in jail when like his commercials were, his video with Santana, you know, all that bullshit like means nothing. So I get arrested, I go through the system, I get out the next day, no problem. Then I'm on the west side, I mean, I'm on the east side, saying shit, crack cocaine, undercover cop, boom. Go in, five years probation, time served. Get arrested again, five years special time served. But by then I told my dad, it's like, this is not gonna work out. He goes, you know, he looked out for me. He was like, come on, I'll go back to California. He was saying goodbye to a friend of his. And I, I don't remember his name. 
Uh, and uh, you know what they said? I see you in heaven. Oh my God. I couldn't believe that. I still couldn't believe that. You know, and then the skateboarding people were there for me, and it was nice. But MacArthur Park, downtown LA, by the pits, and it's like an open drug market, like Washington Square Park, but instead of weed and acid, it was crack, you know? And I was like, oh, no problem. I can do this. And I stayed in that park. I think for like a whole season, I stayed there for like three months. Everything went out the window, you know? And then um, got arrested and got the nine months. Jumanji, come on in, close the door, have a seat. And bad news, your mother died this morning in Brazil. And his mother died of, of AIDS from doing drugs, and he, uh, he never got to say goodbye to his mom. And I think that's something that's always haunted him. She gave me this little thing, if you read the letters, like, I want you to remember me, you know, when we went fishing, you know. And then she said, when you first to walk, you know, I was there. Like, it was amazing. I don't know if anybody knows this, but his, his father basically, like, took, physically took Harry away from his mother. And, like, Harry was crying, his mom was crying, and that's a big thing that a lot of people don't know, that a lot, all of this stems from is his mom. And she said, I want you to think of me in the hospital. The memories, I kept the good memories. I don't have no bad memories in my life. Like, forgive me that I wasn't there for you. Like, you know, that I didn't get to see you. I remember I called my dad, and he was like, come back to New York City. Well, instead of go down by Washington Square and go see my friends downtown, which I haven't seen them, I stopped in Times Square. Like, and this is before Times Square was Disneyland. This is like hookers, peep shows, crack cocaine. And I remember I woke up by Port Authority. And by the grace of God, I don't know, there was a thing right there, and I saw people going in, and I was like, I went in there, I said, dude, I need help, I relapsed, and um, they sent me to Project Renewal. It was the first time I ever, ever went into, like, treatment. It was the first time I got cleaned up and actually went out and got a job and did well. Probably the longest my whole life, you know? That was amazing, I loved it. And then be able to skateboard and everything. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was an amazing time to be in New York City skateboarding, you know, and going to meetings and everything. And of course, I got, I didn't know how to act after a while, you know, I didn't. Stop going to meetings, started using again. That was, that was one of the first situations I remember in my life that he mysteriously disappeared. Because I didn't see him for about a month or so. And the next time I heard from him, I was getting a collect call from Rikers Island. There's a cycle of self-loathing and, and fear of um, success um, and accountability and responsibility that, that Harry's never wanted to uh, acknowledge or deal with. And you can deal with prison, you can deal with addiction, you can deal with anything. You know, at some point, like, you want somebody to come out on the other end. He's a drug addict. That's, that's really the, the simple thing. It's like, he's this beautiful person, but he's also a drug addict, and he's been struggling with drugs for ever since I've known him. But if you can say, yo, I'm getting high, I'm out on a bender, basically saying, fuck you and our friendship. This, the drug is way more important to me. And as far as I'm concerned, like, fuck you. I love you to death, but you're gonna kill yourself. If you didn't see Harry, you just assume that he's in jail, which is like, kind of funny in a way, because he's, oh, he's not around, so he must be in jail. I spent seven years Seven years, within a little bit over a decade, locked up for crack cocaine. It was seriously, you couldn't believe it, you know, because everything else kept going on, and then he came back, and then you see him, and you're like, whoa, what just happened? That's insane. Yeah, that's insane. I, now that I look back on it, you know, I'm just happy to be alive, but yeah, seven fucking years. Skating had evolved, had changed. What's the analogy here? It's like Harry was playing jazz, and then he got out of trouble, and suddenly everyone else was playing pop music. And as skating got more and more technical, 
Harry was also skating less and less because he was screwing up. Frontside flip. Oh, that's it. Wow. I think we met. But Harry's the type of person, he fucking gets out of jail. So he's walking down the street. Some casting agent sees him. Two days later, he's in a fucking Levi's commercial. It's, it's amazing, though. Like, you've seen a rail, and it's made for people to walk up. And yeah, one day we're gonna be old and we might have to use the rail, but right now, today, <laughs> shortcut right there and just grind it down, you know what I mean? So it doesn't happen to normal people. It happens to Harry all the time. Harry had nothing, nobody, and and had to just like hustle still to this day. He wa and he's hustling the bagel that he eats in the morning, hustle the frittata he has for lunch, you know, whatever. But hey man, it's effort and it's a skill set. And it's one that a lot of people don't have. Come here at night, and I give this guy one dollar to two dollars, and guess what he does? He feeds me dinner. How could you be that in Chinatown? I'm talking about nice. God, the daughter's part is better, but I got the food. Hey, bye. So, uh, yeah, and then you do Oh! Oh, no, no, no. I can't get so, yo, I did this in prison for 50 cents an hour. Why can't I do it right here? Just, you know, I'm a hard because guy feel it. Correct? I did this in just 50 cents an hour, like all over the rocks. Hesh, hey, this one's heavy, this one's heavy, be careful. Aya, hesh, go. No, no, no. I don't think Harry's ever actually had a physical ad address in New York. I don't think he, you know, like, he, he doesn't have, like, a dresser for full of clothes or a closet full of clothes, and I've seen Harry do this where if he needs a new sweatshirt, like he'll just walk into a store and take a sweatshirt off the rack and then just like, yeah, what's up, Harry? You know, like just, it's like the longest ongoing sponsorship in skateboarding ever, you know? He just rolls into a sneaker store and they're like, yo, Harry, you need some kicks? Throw him like a box of sneakers, you know? Every time I see him, the guy's got new gear on. He looks better than us, you know what I'm saying? But you know, he's got to look good. He's always carrying a little bag and he's always got something going on. He's got crazy ADD and... Oh, Jumanji, Jumanji. Yeah, Jumanji. Those guys will talk mad shit about Harry. The minute he walks out, that motherfucker, da 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 He walks in, they're flossing him with shit. You know you are. To his face. Nobody will diss Harry. Because your streetswear store has no credibility without fucking Harry Jumanji walking in there. Your store is nothing. Your whole lifestyle you sell is hollow without a Harry Jumanji that really is what you're selling. Him. It's like, I'm Harry Jumanji. I'm Harry Jumanji, New York skateboarder. Like, he builds up his own image. And people fall into that. This is legendary shit right here. <laughs> What's up? Yo, whether I'm on a bike or a skateboard, I'm still king in New York, nigga. <laughs> you make more money than me, but I run the street. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Jumanji, baby. Harry Jumanji. Wow. I remember I got a box of shoes, and I remember he asked me, I said, oh, can I get some shoes? I'm like, oh, yeah, no problem. Take whatever you want, but besides those black ones. He's like, okay. And I got, came back to grab the black ones, and those, like, all the shoes were gone. And then like later on, maybe a week later, one of my friends was like, oh, I saw that guy selling shoes on the bus. <laughs> Uptown. <laughs> oh, so good, though. Like, you know, Harry's also a shifty dude. You jailhouse, you don't really know if he's on the streets, if you don't know where he's getting his money from. So you always gotta keep an eye on that guy like that in your, in your, in your apartment or whatever. So 
So I, you know, he came over and I was like, you want to get high, you got to clean my apartment. So he like rips off all his clothing and it's just like in his underwear, like his tidy whities like it was like New Jack City, but it wasn't. He was like jailhouse shit where he's just like puts his clothing, like folds it high on the fridge so it doesn't get, and he's just like, right, like, cleaning my whole apartment, high out of his mind. I was like, I can't like have Jumanji cleaning my fucking apartment, like butt naked basically. Then I always be like, remember that time you cleaned my apartment? He's like, stop telling people that. I was like, you cleaned my apartment naked. Remember that time? And he always get mad that, that I would like blow him up. Harry is a survival artist. And um, I think part of Harry's survival mechanism is to use whatever's available to him to survive. And that's, you know, that's just the truth. I think I learned that because how I grew up, how I was raised in Brazil. I mean, rich people come to Batuba on the weekends, you know, in the summer. Still the boards, you know. It was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, like I knew guys who were criminals. At least. They break into people's houses, steal everything. We just took like the boards. Que se fala era o Arizinho. Ele sempre ele era terrível assim de. Ore, por exemplo, eu tava no supermercado, pô, falar para ele não, não não vai pegar nada, né? Ele não, tudo bem, vou. Só que ele era tão, tão rápido assim que quando a gente estava na rua ele já começava a tirar do bolso. Você quer chocolate? Você quer doce? Não sei o quê. E sendo que você estava do lado dele, você, você não tinha nem reparado, não conseguia nem ver esse tipo de situação. É, na época eu achava até engraçado isso. É muito fácil ele dar chapéu a alguém, mas acho que ninguém dá um chapéu dele tão fácil. Então eu acho que no, no sentido de rua, na malacagem de rua, isso quer dizer que ninguém. É, praticamente, acho que bota ele no bolso, então ele aprendeu isso muito cedo. Nesse caso, eles me mostraram como, tipo, comer o homem, sabe? De jogar as pessoas no jardim, é tudo frio e... e ir para a sabe? Eu acho que ele fez um pouco de trabalho para fazer o que ele queria, e ele fazia o que ele queria, e não pagar nada para isso, isso foi engraçado. He always got by. He's a good talker, you know. Então a gente ficava esperando, ficava olhando as pessoas comendo pizza na no restaurante, né, do lado de fora, assim, vendo se ia sobrar um pedaço de pizza. I don't think I know. Growing up in Brazil, as a kid in the streets, I learned how to hustle, and that helped me later on in life in the streets in New York City. But if you were to hustle, flip the hustle to like positive hustle, you could do amazing things. Jumanji was strung out on the streets. We would call him the downtown tax. That was his nickname, the downtown tax. You know, you gotta pay taxes in New York. But he was the downtown tax because if he saw you, he would run at you, grab a piece of paper and write your name on a piece of paper and then sell it to you. And you would go to people's houses and you'd see their name or like their business on their wall. And you're like, oh man, fucking the downtown tax. Got him. You gotta pay your downtown tax, man. Jumanji was the downtown tax. Like I saw him the other day and he's, he's like, oh, I wanna draw something for you. And he's all like, High and shit, so he draws the he should stink. It's like it's like his it's like his, his escape, his like artistic flow, like his writing, and that's another beautiful thing that he has. I and mean, he has all these great qualities about him. He hasn't even touched his art. He hasn't even explored where it can go. He's like, yo, Jumanji, you can write, you can do that. People would love what you have mad potential again. One time, um, Consolidated was doing a, a board show, art like a Dex, and I called up Shay and I was like, "Yo, dude, you like have all these guys who really got nothing to do with skateboarding doing Dex. Like, why don't you have Jumanji and Kessler do Dex?" So me and Harry decided we we're gonna do it together. He did all his like cool calligraphy on it, and I did some like graffiti shit. And, like, I'm not much of an artist. Harry had like has like really, he's like actually a gifted artist if you ever took it seriously, and it was like amazing and like it moved a lot of people who were there. Like. You know, one of the beasties was there, and he was like, that's so fucking cool. And Say Adams was like, that's the best board in the show. Like, and of course, Harry, like, showed it, showed up at the event, like, he was like a hurricane, and he came in, and he was like, and I was like, you look great. Jesus, girl, what's up? He's like, I'm, I'm great. Like, took his shirt off and, like, did, like, 100 push-ups in the hallway. So walk around with his shirt off, it's a dead of winter. And, like, no lie, like, there were chicks there who just wanted to, they wanted to fuck Harry, like, with his shirt off, and he's like, all like, He's like superstar again. Like I was like, he's he still got it. And it's like, yo, you write the dope. Maybe the writing came from your institutionalized fucking jail time, but you write it. Why don't you do something? His hand style is insane. 
it's beautiful. I mean, and it's natural. Honestly, probably one of my favorites, for sure. If not my favorite. I would love to collaborate with Harry at some point. I put him in an art show. I remember Dice Projects had this show years ago, and it was, they, they got these guys from Chicago build a, a skate bowl. And it was about like skateboarding art, but it was just like street artists, skate artists, but it was like a big deal. This one, the, the, this is like at Dice one is like at its height, you know what I'm saying, on, on Wooster Street. And they asked me to be like the MC of the party. But then like my one thing is like, if you guys are gonna do a show about skateboarding and, and art, you gotta get your money. Nobody knew how, like those people didn't know how your money was. So Dice, Jeffrey Dice, and the curious at the time, I was like, this is the wall I'm taking. I'm gonna give it to Harry. I think the best part was like here, man. Just right, what skateboarding means to you and how, you know, and um, I went, I went deep, I went beyond. On the wall, just like wrote his life story, you know? Like really big too, and it was beautiful, you know? And like, so I always wanted to put him in the conversation to help him get into that place. I wasn't a writer, like, you know, doing trains and stuff. I learned how to write when I went to prison. And a friend of mine named Steve Olson asked me, and he said, did you ever thought about your skating with your Sharpie when you are locked up? And I was like, wow, because, you know, it, it's like skateboarding with the marker, you know, the calligraphy. And then I look up the art of penmanship, you know, the letters is in harmony. And I would like to take the calligraphy and, you know, do something with it. Like Futura said, you have an amazing handwriting. Don't waste it, you know? Somebody else was like, dude, if you didn't do stuff for a lot of people, you should be worth so much money. And I was like, and I know this is gonna sound like an idiot. If I die tomorrow, the lady in the laundry and her kids and the pro skateboarder and the so-and-so will have a little piece of me. I gave them a little bit out of my heart to every one of them, you know. And he started taking Harry out to Montauk with him quite a bit to get him out of the city to really start realizing that there's slippery slopes in the city that sometimes you can't avoid. And the best way to avoid them is to get out of the city, you know? There was a bond that I had with Andy, like there was no, you know, oh, I should, no, I, I can tell Andy anything, you know, anything. And uh, then we started talking about life and, you know, we even talk about my dad and, you know, when was the last time you seen your dad? And uh, I would say the best part is going in the water with Andy. I know it sounds crazy, but when you go in the water and you're surfing in Montauk, you come out, it like, it cleans your soul, it helps you, it, it's amazing. Because you can't just cut drugs out and not replace it with something. So surfing was a great thing for them to go put their energy into. He hadn't been on a surfboard in 20 years. I think the first week he paddled into, he just like stood right up and rode this wave and I saw him and I was like blown away. I was like, wow. In one sentence, Montauk is Uba Tuba, but on the East Coast to me. Montauk and the beach and surfing, I was like, his passion. And it's because of Andy Castro, it's because of the ocean. And I don't know how to put it together, but spiritually and in my heart, Montauk, yeah, this is it, man, you know. And uh, Andy got stung by a uh, wasp and he was allergic and he died and he didn't die right away <clears throat> it took a couple hours and they, they went to a fire station and they, they didn't have an EpiPen and, and uh, before he got to the hospital Andy passed that's my bullshit I like you know and I could have saved Andy's life because the person who drove him didn't go straight to the hospital. They don't have that in Montauk. He went to like a doctor to the firehouse. And I don't question the chain of events anymore, but um, it's like when I was really, really, really hit, fresh out of died. They asked me, like, I didn't say anything about skateboarding. I said, he saved my life. And then he says, I wish I could save his. It's just it was such a freak accident, you know, to have like a bee allergy and be stung. You know, and, and uh, the way that that all happened, mm, there's no there's no explanation for it. It's just it's just something that that happened and was uh, was a lesson, you know, to everybody as well as just to, I think it's just it's it's part it was part of Andy's story, you know. So I got the call when he died from Dennis McNett, 
And a second later, Harry called, uh, Andy, he called me on Andy's phone. And he was fucking distraught. When I got there, um, the police were there. And, um, and Harry was standing there and just kind of looked really um, in shock and not knowing what to do. And uh, I grabbed him and, you know, he uh, came with me and he ended up staying with me for about a month, month and a half. And we uh, kind of uh, went through that process together. I kind of was trying to help him grieve and grieving myself, you know, loss of a really good friend. Uh, when we buried him out there, Harry was very emotional. Oh, it was like something out of like a Shakespearean, you know, play or something. He was just throwing himself on the ground and then putting his hands in the dirt and just, you know, and it wasn't a show. It wasn't like he was acting. That's the passion that Harry has, you know, and he loved Andy. A man who touched so many lives in so many ways. He was a skateboarding pioneer, legend, grandmaster. He was a surfer, friend. He was an artist, mentor, and for some, a last hope to become clean and sober. And when they bury Andy, they bury my mother and Andy, because I didn't go to her funeral. So how you like that, you know? I was angry. But some days, when it really kills me, I go to a meeting with this and that, and I miss having just a fucking hug for a minute. Like, you know when you hug people and you feel it? Andy wasn't a hugging type of guy, but he was that guy, you know? When you hugged him, you felt it like, you know? I felt safe to run Andy Cassidy. I don't feel safe to run a lot of people in skateboarding. And I miss that. I miss my friend. Like I miss my mother. And I was angry. It's like, why would you leave me now? You know? But um, I didn't question anything. We had a big paddle out. You know, for Andy, where God, I think like hundreds of people came. People came from the city, people came from all over for this paddle out. And, you know, Harry was very front and center and sort of Andy's death as well. And people really rallied around Harry to, it was almost a part of Andy's death, you know what I mean? Like Harry was sort of like, people really wanted Harry to get clean. So a lot of people got behind him and weren't involved. One Kess Pass, he's skating with Alvin, all his heroes, and, and he was killing it. Him and Tino were going out to Autumn. He was just killing it. And, and uh, you know, all those videos were like fucking, they were like showing up. And he fucking was ripping so much style. The thing at Autumn Bowl was beyond skateboarding. And then we're here to celebrate his life, not his death. Big difference, right? We're here to look at the light, not the darkness, you know? I mean, it was insane, the energy going on and the camaraderie and everything that was happening was just like such a dope moment. He gave me the juju back, you know? He gave me that, that magic that, you know? And like, he loves to skate when he's clean and he rips, rips. Being a kid and having a skateboard is a gift. If you come from a broken family, you know, because then you think your board is out the house and you're like, wow, you know, I have a friend, you know. I can actually say skateboarding was like my best friend. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Square had steps and the cops used to drive into the circle so they put cement over the steps and that became a little skate park. They never closed the park at night. That's before crack. I know you gotta do your job, but can we get just one shot? Look, I promise it's gonna be five seconds. No, Harry tried to keep it real for Andy as long as he could, but straight out, there was nobody there for him anymore. When Andy died, I, th I mean, Andy meant a lot to him, and I th thought that, that was, if there was gonna be a turning point, that would be a turning point. Like, Harry's just probably have so many demons inside of him. I'm sure that was just yet another form of ammunition for him to just go back down into this bell jar that he has 
within himself. If you're gonna get fucking high, then get high, but get the fuck out of our face. Because you're disrespecting one of my best friends in life. I haven't slept since um, the students. Mm. This is a good one. Good night. I'm just gonna come on call just do this if I can get it. I'm just gonna show you the number with it. Because I can't people act like they're doing their fucking favor and saying, like, they so stupid. Contacts. It's like, you know, whatever, smoke a joint, you know, drink a beer. She's been doing a call with me, it's a heroin, you fucking crack me with a wall, you know? The vice, right? And then when it does, it becomes a habit, right? I can do a bag and skateboard. You know, yeah, I'm well, right, chill, right? People are like, wow, so people be knowing it. But look what happens after the second or third day. Two bags, then three bags. So what do you got now? Chipping. You get a little fucking back pain. You know, start running. And then eventually you get a monkey on your back. You know what a monkey on your back is? Yeah. And then some people get a Google on their back. I was lucky. I never had a Google on my back, but I had a monkey on my back. And the others should be calling your name. So, hmm. That's what you do, you cut corners with it, you know, and then you say, oh, well, this one, you know, put it you crack. I like this half. This is for some old, old school guys, you know what I mean? It's like I grew up with guys, if you roll a joint in the seat and they would have beat you up. Don't drop anything out. Look at the see that? See? Look. Look. That's a professional way to do it. And they call scarfing. Scarfing is when you take a bang like this. You know, but then you know, it's like super thirsty, like why would I waste it, you know? And that's funny, right? It's like how do you can do that with an umbrella in the way like this, you know, learn from the best. Your chill is whatever, you know, it's not like you feel like it's something and I just feel silly miserable right now. It's like, you know, I'm back this or here. And of course I was lucky because my mother, you know. Excuse me, and she died, so that's how I scared me. And I think that's the one. Now I gotta call it back. That's the one. I'm gonna put it in the middle of this. And then you go like this, and then like this, and then you go. best and, and when he's got it together we are all there for him but I think it's been so long we've seen him struggle that you know we've all gotten burned emotionally or, or otherwise and, and um, I think a lot of us are unwilling at this point to extend ourselves unless he's gonna really he really be clean and I saw Dante Ross the other day and Dante Ross is real close with him and, and uh, you know he said the same thing like when everyone gave up on Harry we always tried to help him out you know Go and visit him in jail, sending him money, sending him sneakers. No, not white sneakers, you know, like, whatever, you know, Harry Jumanji style stuff. And it's like, it hurts because, you know, you know, like Harry stole from me. You know, Harry just, just did a lot of horrible things, you know. He knew where I lived, like when I lived on Downing Street for 20 years. And he, he told me he would just come by and wait for me to come out. You know, he goes, I know you live here. I'm not going to, like, come up to your apartment. I'm just going to wait for you to come out, and then I'll talk to you, whatever. You know, always ask him for money. You know, can you lend me some money? But that's fine. But I never, you know, turned him down. If I had something, I'd give it to him. A lot of times people are like, man, I want to help. You know, I don't know what to do. And if I give you the money, you're just going to go get high. But I just don't want to see you die. And this fucked up feeling, because they'll give you the money. These are the kids that look up to you, you know, growing up skateboarding. Now they're good, you know, and I'll... And then the guilt, you know, as soon as you get a fix or you get high, then you think about it. How evil that shit is because you're back to square one, you know, it's like, um, you're not free. I mean, there was times where I'd see him and I'd cross the street because I could see the state he was in, you know, and it'd been dozens of times. I didn't want to hear it. I'm like, I'm over it, man. I love you, but you're not going to listen to me. 
Everybody, I'm gonna give you 20 bucks and you're gonna go get high, you're not gonna get something to eat. And that's what Harry's been doing, starting all over again, starting all over again. I mean, it's, it's to the point where you can visually see the, the, the effects of his drug use. It takes all the fluid off your body, too. Look, it's insane. Like, 2% body fat is supposed to be this much, and look at this. This is less than 2% body fat. Stupid, look at that. It's nothing. Look at this, it's not even normal. It's like skin, like skin, just the skin. It's not right. There's so much to see if you pick your hand under your arm, if you go like that around it. Like, this is not normal right here, to have this much right here on the side. I usually like, grab a nice chunk right here if everybody has it. You know, like. I think he's blowing it. He hasn't blown it, but definitely blowing it. I heard Andy say it too much. We're pulling him out of the gutter, and, and he's all fucked up on God knows what, crack and dope. And Andy was like, Harry, you got to get it together, man. I'm going to a meeting right now. Let's go. He's like, I can't go to a meeting. I'm high. He's like, you can do whatever you want. He, and he told him, he said, I tried drugs. You've been to jail. You fucking lie. You steal. You cheat. You blow it every time. He's like, you only got two things left to do, die or get sober. He'll stop when he was ready to stop. And maybe he won't. After he had relapsed, our friend Jennifer got him into a treatment center in Virginia where he met Monica. I had gone to a meeting at a recovery center called Edge Hill. And Harry was at the same meeting. And I remember hearing him share during the meeting. And what he was talking about really like touched me. After the meeting, you know, I went up to him and I was like, wow, you know, hi, my name is Monica, and, you know, your words really touched me. And, you know, we started talking, and he just has, like, such a presence about him that just attracted me to him. You know, every time I would go to a meeting, I would see him, and we just became friends that way. And, you know, he had this huge plan for us. We were going to move to California you know, and start our life there, and eventually move to Brazil together. And, you know, we talked about getting married and having kids and, you know, the dream that everybody wants. We know, no, no, no. Why did it change? What are you thinking about? <laughs> Harry, look at me. What are you thinking about? Are you still posing for the picture? I ended up getting pregnant, and we were both very happy. We used to call it Baby Phoenix. We you know, raise Baby Phoenix in California, and then go to Brazil. But just noticed that he just started slacking. He stopped going to meetings. And I just built up so many resentments towards him. We were fighting all the time. There was just so much financial stress on us. And it caused a lot of problems between us, unfortunately. So we went our separate ways. You know, he went to Montauk. And I stayed in Virginia. I got scared, I didn't know how to deal with it. I bugged out and I left, you know. I came to New York City, you know, it was... Maybe it was for the best. And it put a lot of pressure on Harry. You know, he had Andy die and then the kid and all that stuff. And, and, and I think like, you know, he really would like to be able to take care of his kid, but he can't even take care of himself. I think being pregnant, <laughs> and watching the love of your life leave. It's so hard. He used to tell everyone I would never leave Monica or my child, never. I will always take care of them. I will always be there for them, do the good, the bad, the ugly. But then he left and he just disappeared. And that was the worst pain I've ever felt in my entire life. 
he was already pretty convinced that he'd blow it with the kids, so he just blew it. It's like he fulfills this negative prophecy time and time again. And so it gives him another piece of pain to kind of hold on to, and also on some levels exploit. When the baby was born, and Harry was freaking out about Monica and everything, I said, Harry, I know from experience that you can be completely absent, if you want, from Monica and your daughter's life for the first three years. Because he was like, I gotta get sober, I gotta get money for Monica, I gotta, and I go, Harry, all this craziness, it's only gonna result in you going back to doing drugs because you're loading all, like, you've never had an apartment, you've never had a job, you've never had an income, much less income to send to somebody, so you're putting way too much pressure on yourself all at one time. Deal with your sobriety, don't worry about Monica, she's in Virginia with family and friends and she's got support, you deal with getting yourself sober for your daughter. I don't think that his last run is gonna be the last time he goes out, you know? I don't. And it scares me, because what am I gonna tell Sophia? Every time he has a piece of those kind of like, painful moments he will manipulate whether it's Kessler dying, whether it's a story about his him being kidnapped, his mom dying of AIDS, or, or his child and how he can't be involved in his child's life. And, and one of the things in a lot of those situations is Harry doesn't take accountability for himself. But the main thing that Harry could do is get clean and be a dad to his daughter, which is an amazing thing. And, and he may find is more amazing than anything he's ever experienced before. I didn't think I was gonna leave to see a job. That's the truth, you know. When I saw it, it broke me and then, um, Weird. It's like I say, hold the board, hold the baby. No, when you hold your own child, they'll do something to you. Like in here, they'll hit a spot that, I don't know. Maybe the last time I felt that spot that I don't remember is when my mother hold me, and that was a long time ago. Yeah, just hold her. Okay, 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 okay. Look, 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 I'm close to you now, okay? I am your father. I want you to, okay, yeah, I know. Then look, Rosita, she's looking out for you. She don't get to hold the baby. It's not fair. Hmm? I want to take her to Brazil and show her where I come from, where my mom is from, and put her in the water and be like, look at this. Not New York City, MTV, like, yo, check the water up in here. This is where I come from. Hi, baby, Georgia. Look at that, she's sleeping. definitely thought that he was going to be a part of her life in some way or another. I didn't think that was going to be like the first time and the last time that he saw Sophia. <laughs> well, I met Adam Graham and he and I fell in love and he met Sophia and he has basically been raising Sophia as his own daughter since she was 18 months. And that's basically all she knows is Adam. Daddy, faster! Okay. Faster than that. If Harry were to get clean, That's a really tough question because I also have to consider like how Adam feels. I would want him to be a part of Sophia's life. I really would. I know it eats Harry up inside that he can't be like there for the kid, but he also can't be there for the kid unless he gets sober. Andy's gone now. Do it for your daughter. Um, what kind of my skateboard? Sweeper day. January. It 
it hurts me because I wasn't part of, I didn't get to see my daughter walk. I didn't get to see my daughter talk, you know. And yeah, it's never too late, but part of me is like, dude, man, man up, you know. There is a way. The mother of my child, you know, she's, she's doing a great job, you know. I'm not bitter and angry. To me, it's more like, um, God damn it, not again, Harry. What the fuck are you doing? I don't mean to cuss, I'm sorry about that, but um, it's just, I want the best for Harry, you know? He needs to stop being Harry Jumanji the skater and just be Harry, a person, a human being that is just normal and I don't think he's enjoying life. Not the way he's living. It's all a facade. It's like, dude, aren't you tired? Don't you want something different? I never heard a successful story about people smoking crack. I never, ever my whole life. <laughs> For guys like Harry Jumanji, it's like, is it worth it? What do, you, what do you value most in your life? And if you really love skateboarding, if you love, be, you love your freedom, if you love your life, then let's grow up a little bit and start making the right choices. Very recently, I got back into the bullshit. Like, I didn't get my feet wet. I jumped into the puddle of shit all up to my neck. Here we are once again, going towards the first step of recovery, go to detox. <laughs> it used to be 14 days, now it's only seven days. They cut in half, I think, Medicaid. They're not paying for it. Much as I love skateboarding, if I knew that dad was gonna end up into the crack cocaine in the prison time, I would have rather been a regular Joe or went to school or even anything. I'm gonna try to do it this time. If they're at a point where they need to be told, look, dude, you're gonna end up back in prison or dead, is that where you wanna go? Yeah, we'll tell them that. But we're still are gonna save a seat for them and just go, dude, just come back. Just dust yourself off and come back. I'm at this place, Salvation Army. It keeps me busy. I work, I go to meetings, you know. I go to church on a Sunday. I'm doing things differently this time, you know. I'm not going around like hustling, you know. This is like, it's like the last shot, you know. It's not about the Harry or Gigi Monge anymore. It's about that little girl, you know, you know. It's about, it's about my daughter, it's about Sophia. Now, the thing about Harry is that uh, he's a really great person with a lot to give. He's so warm and loving, and uh, you really always want to see him make it. And despite all the pain, will do his damnedest to show how much he loves people. And to me, that means he's still in there, pure. And he's not broken, because he cares. Once someone's really gone, they don't give a shit. They're walking around with ripped ass out the fucking boxers with no pants on down, you know, Broadway. So I know that Harry's still in there. Harry's kind of almost like a Jay Adams, you know? Like he looks at the world through the wonderment eyes of a child, you know? He's got this purity about him. And he's excited, you know, and he doesn't let past stuff tear down his ability to live presently in the moment. I would like to walk into the skateboard store and saw like Tony Alva, Chris on the side, and, and Harry Jumon skateboard tag. This is what Harry deserves. And he's not gone, so he still can be an inspiration. You know what's getting crazy about Harry? He's gonna probably outlive all of us. You know what I mean? He'll probably be like that old guy that outlives everybody, you know? Cause just cause he's lived not nine lives, 90 lives. You know, he's more than a cat. He just, I don't know how he does it. I think we're gonna see a, a lot of great things coming out of, uh, Harry's life.
Father and to me it was weird because I kind of detached. Like, you know, if I die, I got cut, or stabbed in prison, or shot up, you know, in the projects, or OD. It sounds selfish, but I don't want to live with that. So I kept simple. When I saw him, like, you know, he looks like Yoda. He's mad old. And he says, I am sorry, and he cried. And I said, I love you. I want to say I love you, no matter what. I says, I don't care what happened. You're my father, and I love you. I love you, I love you too, Harry. Come on. Okay, you gotta get it. Easy, baby. How does it feel? This is surreal, you know? I want to spend the rest of my days here. When I took my shoes off, my feet hit the ground, and then I hit the water, I felt like I died when it happened. When I was a kid and Ubatuba was like heaven. 34 years later, it was like the ocean, everything, just like it was. I'm happy I came home. <laughs> 